my name's Laurie and today is Palm Sunday and my experience was that we would do lots of Palm Sunday things. Now we're not going to be doing that today, we're not going to be focusing specifically on Holy Week but we are focusing on Easter and what Easter means to us all but beyond that what the ultimate meaning of Easter is and so uh, I'm very much looking forward to this service as a sense of uh, just exploring the theological truth of Easter, the human divine interaction that Easter enables us all to have. My reading for today is John chapter 16 verses 5 to 15. But now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's judgment and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is is that it refused to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I say to you, the spirit will tell you whatever he he receives from me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Our reading takes place at the Last Supper. If you read Matthew, Mark and Luke, the Last Supper is a fairly short affair focused in on the, uh, the, 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 the bread and the cup. Jesus says a few things and there's, you know, he, he uh, identifies Judas as his betrayer and then there's the bread and the cup. But beyond those, there's not a whole lot that happens in the Matthew, Mark and Luke telling of the Last Supper. In the Gospel of John's telling of the Last Supper, it takes up almost a third of his entire book. It starts at chapter 13 and continues through to the end of chapter 17. And many of the teachings that we are very familiar with, with Jesus, like, I am the true vine and you are the branches. This takes place in that section around the Lord's table there. Or I am the way, the truth and the life is another teaching of Jesus that in the Gospel of John takes place around this table in the last meal. I love you as my Father has loved you, says Jesus at this very time. Now remain in my love. These are all familiar teachings to us, but these all come from this Last Supper. So as we unpack the sermon for today, I want you to place yourself in the scene. And I want you to imagine yourself as one of the disciples around this table and you are enjoying this last meal with Jesus. And let's be honest, Jesus is saying some really weird stuff. He's talking about dying, he's talking about rising again, he's talking about going away, he's just, just like, here you are, you've just been through the triumphant entry, this is Palm Sunday, this is the, the, the day in which the church traditionally remembers the triumphant entry of Jesus, I mean, this day, this day, the week before Christmas, represents, if you will, the high point of Jesus' ministry life. I mean, look, the crowds of Jerusalem are coming out and celebrating him as the coming king. I mean, surely we as his disciples gathered around this table merely six days later, we have everything to look forward to. We have so much to be excited about. But Jesus is just on completely different wavelength, saying really weird stuff about going away and dying and even rising again. And uh, we, we don't quite know what wavelength he's on. And what I want to focus in on today is this statement here, it is good that I go, this is in verse 7 of our reading, for it is good that I am going away, unless I go, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you, the Spirit who will guide you into all truth. I think within this statement, and this is what I want to unpack, not just for you, but with you. So once again, I just want to, I'm going to throw out some questions and we're going to build a bit of a sermon and a bit of a reflection together through this, through this time. I think this startling statement, it is good that I go away, is both a startling statement, so we want to reflect on that for a minute, but it's also an extraordinary promise. And so let's start with a startling statement. 
It is good that I go away. If we are the disciples, six days after the triumphant entry, gathered around this table, this last, uh, the, what, what we now call um, the, uh, the, the Last Supper, but we didn't know it was going to be the Last Supper. I mean, people, we, now, we know that now, but around the table, they had no idea this was going to be their Last Supper with Jesus. If we're gathered together and Jesus looks us straight in the eye and says, it is good that I go away, would you have agreed with Jesus or not? Yes or no? How many of you, many of you would have sat there going, oh, yeah, yeah actually, yeah, it's, it's about time you left. It is good that you went away. I'm, 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 glad, you, I'm glad you can finally see that. Now, like, how many of us would have been on that wavelength? Or how many of us would have been on the wavelength maybe of going, really? No, no, it's not good that you go away. You, you need to stay more. So here's my first question for feedback. If we are the disciples of Jesus sitting around the tables, what arguments might the disciples or might we have made to try and convince Jesus that it was not a good thing for him to go away? What counter-arguments would we have put? No, no, Jesus, it's not good that you go away because what do you reckon we would have said to Jesus? I? Why? Any arguments you could have made? Well, in light of what's just happened in terms of coming into Jerusalem and everybody wanting you being there and us being there with you, um, don't give up now. You're, this is your moment. It's fantastic. Maybe they were thinking, like, you, you're going to get into trouble because, like, they were... Um, w weren't the Pharisees saying something like, you, you know, you're going to get yourself into trouble being called the king as they, they were coming in? And then if... that They might know that, you know, trouble's going to happen and if he's saying he's going to go away, they'll be like, you know, you're leaving us to deal with all of this. Yeah. Perhaps. So, so possibly feeling abandoned by Jesus, like, mate, you know, it's getting hot around here, it's getting hot in the kitchen and you're going to leave, you're going to abandon us? Yeah. An argument that could, they could have made might have been that Jesus had a, still had a whole world to heal. The work is unfinished, there is still a whole world to heal. So why would you leave now when there's so much still to be done? You haven't kicked the Romans out yet. <laughs> and politically... He's not fulfilled what they understood to be his calling as the coming king. Drive the Romans out, re-establish the capital of uh, Israel in Jerusalem. When Jesus speaks about the need for him to go away, he doesn't, say, I'm just, he doesn't just say, I'm going away and I'm going to leave you alone. He says, I have to go away so the advocate may come. In the Greek language, the language in which the New Testament is originally written, the word for advocate, or the word that our New Living Translation translates as advocate, is this word here, parakletos. Parakletos. Parakletos is a compound word. In other words, it's actually two Greek words stitched together to make one word. The first word is actually one that you would probably recognize because we use it in English, para. Uh, in the Greek spelling, it looks like, it looks like papa. But the, uh, the, the letter that looks like a P is actually rho. It's pronounced as an R, para. Um, and this is like parallel, parallel lines, the para. It means beside or alongside of. And then the second word is kletos. So kletos means the invited one or the called one. If I was to invite uh, you to come to a celebration, like a graduation or an ordination or a significant event, you would come along as my kletos, my invited one. Uh, if you were to come as a guest to my house, you would come as my invited one, my Kletos. Uh, it's interesting, the, uh, the verse, many are called but few are chosen. The word called there is kletos, many are invited. Uh, it, it's interesting, M many are kletos. Uh, it's interesting just to be, sort of unpack the meaning of that word in that context. Um, so literally what a parakletos is, the one invited or the one called beside you. So one way of reading what Jesus is saying here when he says, I have to go, so the parakletos... I'm now going to switch just, I'm going to use the Greek word for a little while, so that, and then we'll come back to English in a minute. Um, it's good that I go away so the parakletos might come. One way of reading that is to say, I am sending the one who is called or invited beside you. I am sending the one invited beside you. I'm sending the one called beside you. Compound words are interesting. Parakletos, like I said, it's two words stitched together. One of the things we've got to be careful about with, with any compound word in any language is we don't just divide it up into its two separate words and then think we can understand the meaning of that one word based upon the two words that we stitch together. 
co uh, compound words in English and in any language, they can develop their own emphasis. And this is equally true in the Greek language. So Parakletos developed two particular emphasis. The first is this. It developed a bit of a legal sense. And so w words like advocate or advisor or mediator or intercessor or helper would be the kinds of English words that would capture the emphasis of the legal sense of this word. One who appears on another person's behalf. One who stands beside a person to represent them, but sort of in a more formal and legal sense, maybe at a ceremony, maybe in a law court, maybe, you know, the person who represents you in a, in a real estate deal, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a dramatic legal case, it can just be a normal sense of someone who stands beside you to represent you in a formal or potentially a legal sense, that person is called your parakletos. But there's also a general sense, so one who is called to help or one who is called to someone's aid. If you're in trouble for whatever reason, if you're suffering a medical condition and someone rushes along and offers you aid, that person becomes your parakletos. If you're hiking and you twist your, your ankle and you need to lean on someone so that you can hobble all the way to, back to the car park and jump in the car, that person is your parakletos. It's interesting that Jesus, now we know because later on in the reading it becomes clear, when Jesus speaks of this parakletos, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. So the way we often shortcut this is to say, Jesus said, it is good that I go so the Holy Spirit can come. But I find it fascinating that he didn't just come out and say it that way. You know, I'm going to go, Holy Spirit going to come, done deal. He said, I'm going to go and parakletos is going to come. He uses a term which is hardly ever used, but I think has a very specific meaning. So this is my question for you. How do we capture the impact of this word? Or maybe put it, put it another way. What English translation could we come up with that we think captures the impact of what seems to be meant by this idea of parakletos? How would you describe this parakletos in your own words? Have a go at it. Protector or friend? It's protector and friend. Brilliant. Uh, companion? Yeah. A legal aid lawyer. A, a guide. What occurs to me is a trusted advisor. In church, we often speak of the Holy Spirit, but there's often sort of a more mystical sense that we tend to put on top of it. But what I find fascinating about the way that Jesus is introducing this topic to his disciples is I think there's something deeply intimate and relational about it. One who walks beside you. I love some of the English translations that we came up with, that, that, that we just heard now. There's a sense of companion, a sense of friend, a sense of someone journeying along beside you through life. But more than just journeying with you, there's a sense of being a guide, someone who can point the way or help you navigate through difficult terrain or challenging circumstances. There's a sense here of something that is, I guess, less mystical, less ethereal, and something more real and grounded and practical and connected to us in the experience of our everyday lives. We learn that the parakletos is the Holy Spirit, so what do you think Jesus is drawing to our attention with the use of the title parakletos? Let's push a little bit deeper. We've talked about definition, what word would be used to describe parakletos? Now let's push one step a little bit deeper. What is Jesus drawing to our attention? What is it about the Holy Spirit? What is the nature of this parakletos, this spirit, that Jesus is particularly trying to put right in front of our field of vision? Oh, you're not abandoned. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess picks up exactly the concern that, that we identify the disciples may have had when Jesus said, it's good that I go away. That sense of abandonment. No, no, don't go. No, don't leave us alone. And that sense of Jesus replying, saying, no, no, no. The one who is invited to be beside you will come. You're not alone and you're not abandoned. It's beautiful. Thank you. This uh, relationship is one with God's presence that is entering to my experience. Whatever my experience is, it's a sense in which that God is with me. And uh, so each of us has unique circumstance, but that God comes to us into our own circum situation. Do you know that Jesus was fully human? He was fully divine, but he was fully human. Do you know what one of the problems with being fully human is? He can only be at one place at the one time. He could walk beside one disciple at a time, or maybe because he's got two sides to himself, two disciples at a time. 
But once he started getting to much more than that, it gets a lot harder, and certainly he could not walk with billions of disciples at a time. You know what? It is good that Jesus went away, because when Jesus went away, the parakletos came so that God, Jesus, could walk beside all of us. And I think that's the point, Laurie, that you were drawing out there, so thank you. Uh, Parakletoses, unless it's parakletos I, <laughs> um, are needed. Um, you, you need to rely on other people. And, um, and Jesus is the, the ultimate. Beautiful, Andrew. And so what you're drawing to our attention is actually the incredibly important point that we're also called to be each other's parakletoses. There you go, that's my attempt at a plural. Um, parakletoi would be the Greek plural, but nonetheless, that's fine. But we are called to be the parakletos to each other as well. So Jesus, up through the Spirit, is the ultimate companion who walks beside us, who guides us and who helps us. But you're right, you're picking up there a, a, a calling that is on all of us. May we be the parakletos the parakletoi, plural, to each and every one of us. Anyone else? Just a reflection. What is Jesus drawing to our attention with this? You need some help. Yeah. 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 You know, it's one of the hardest things for any of us to admit. I am not enough. I need someone beside me. It also appears that he's transitioning something from the Old Testament into the New Testament. This is a new era because... You know, the Spirit came on people in special ways in the Old Testament, but it wasn't sort of widely done. And now he's saying, no, no, everyone is going to have a parakletos. So me going means that all of my followers will now have a parakletos. Beautiful. So the Holy Spirit came regularly in the Old Testament, but it was always to empower someone to a special purpose in a special moment, to give a prophecy or to perform a mighty act or to do something spectacular. Now it's switching from having the power of God to do something amazing. Now, and now you know, with Jesus, he's saying, no, no, this is to have a companion so that my life walks with you through your life. Um, he seems to be maybe uh, helping the disciples as well, changing the way they're thinking. So this is, he's offering God as in a relational way, whereas Jesus has just come in on Palm Sunday and everybody's been... Praising him, he's the new king. Um, Jesus is giving them a different perspective of viewing God as rather than that unreachable um, king that they're going to be able to enter into an actual relationship one-on-one. -on -one. It's brilliant. I, th I think as we're reflecting on what the disciples may have thought about this idea of Jesus going away, one of the observations we made was, no, 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 you know, you've just been announced king six days ago by the crowds. You know, this is not the time to, to, to take your foot off the pedal. You know, this is the time to accelerate even harder and build on the momentum that you've built up. But I love that, Jane. Jesus is actually saying, no, no, that's not the point. I'm not here to be crowned an earthly king and installed by a crowd of people. I'm actually here for a different purpose. And it's about the life of God journeying with us. Thank you about the word para and that being to come alongside I think that's also suggesting that God isn't just in the temple anymore that he's um, it, it's a new way of thinking about how to relate to God not just up above but right there with you all the time it's beautiful beautiful the one who comes beside us I love these times of corporate reflection. I don't know about you, but I, I get great value out of hearing the different reflections and the different ways people process these things. So I trust that you get great value and encouragement out of that too. Jesus then builds on that to say, hey, I've also have, I also have an extraordinary promise. This spirit is going to enter the world and is going to do something in this world. And the first thing it's going to do is this. In the world, he says, first he starts, if you will, in the world as a whole, looking at the whole planet as it exists. In the world, he says, the Spirit's going to do these three things. It's going to convict the world of sin, reveal God's righteousness, and remind the world of the coming judgment. Now, I don't know about you, but in my 21st century Western brain, um, sort of, you know, niceness as a, as a virtue in the Christian church, I read those things and I went, oh, that's a bit disappointing. It's all a bit hardcore. Convict the world of sin, righteousness, remind the world of the coming judgment. Oh, it's like... You know, God, God, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come into the world with a big stick and beat everyone up. It was sort of my, was sort of my first little theological reflection on that. So I found myself 
wrestling with it a little bit. But what I, uh, what I sort of discerned as I pressed into this is what these are is that the Spirit, God is sending the Spirit in the world to disrupt those things in the world which are not the life of God. That one of the works of the Holy Spirit is actually going to be a disruptive work. Things are going to be knocked off balance. People are going to be, to be convicted. Uh, sin is going to be revealed. Light is going to be shone into dark places. Hidden things are going to be drawn to the surface. And that means sometimes embarrassment or judgment or, you know, court cases or, you know, different things are going to happen in the lives of people because the Spirit of God is at work churning up and turning over that which is not the life of God, not the truth of God, and exposing and revealing things that need to be exposed, hidden sins, damaging relationships, harmful people, and in its place, birthing and building the life of God, creating the conditions so the life of God would flourish. And I found myself reflecting on this question, and I'm going to throw this in front of you. This is a bit of a harder question, and so I'm, I'm going to give you an answer to get you started, but I really want you to reflect on this. What examples do we have of Jesus doing the work of convicting the world of sin, revealing God's righteousness, and reminding the world of the coming judgment? What what examples do we have in the life of Jesus, of Jesus doing this work? And let me give you an example just, just to get the ball rolling and get your creative Jesus thinking in this direction. The very first story that popped to my mind was the woman caught in adultery. She had been caught in sin. As a matter of fact, we're told in the very act of sin. Undeniable, caught in the act. She was hauled off to Jesus, thrown at his feet, and the law was announced. She has to be thrown, a stoned to death. That is what the law of Moses declares is for her. And how did Jesus expose sin, convict the world of sin? How did Jesus reveal righteousness in that moment? Do you know what he did? He revealed the unjust hearts of those who were accusing her. The person who is without sin, let you be the one who casts the first stone. This is revealing God's righteousness. We think revealing God's righteousness is to stand on the side around this woman, pick up a stone and throw it at her. But the righteousness of God is revealed when true justice is done, when we do not just stand in judgment of others, somehow imagining that we are clean and pure ourselves and therefore we have the right to judge others. But the true righteousness of God is seen when we allow the life and the Spirit of God to do His work of convicting us and shaping us and changing us and challenging us so that we can actually be like Jesus who can bring true justice, true equity, true righteousness, and actually true mercy and true grace into a deeply broken world. That was the example that popped to my mind as I was thinking about how did Jesus convict the world of sin and reveal God's righteousness? And let me say, like God always does, he does it with true justice, but he does it in surprising ways. When it's such a simple story, she sins, she, she gets killed, when, when the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, came into that situation, he complicated the situation, but he also exposed the greater sins that were happening all around, and hence, actually then exposed people's needs for God, but also opened up the opportunity for true mercy and grace to be shown. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in our world today, as initiated and revealed through the life of Jesus. As I've been talking about that, anyone else just had any other stories of the life of Jesus that have come to your mind where you can see, wow, yeah, this is part of the work of Jesus, part of what he did? The story of the prodigal son where he says, I'd really like you to die and, and me to get your money now. And then he goes off and he squanders it all. But then the father's there waiting for him. The one that jumped to me, and it's not some, it's very the convicting of the world of sin, but is ambiguous a bit. But it's a, when Jesus talks to the Canaanite woman mm. who makes that comment about dogs and eating the scraps, mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, the one that came to mind for me, and probably has a bit of all three, is uh, when Jesus uh, went to the into the entrance to the temple and turned over the tables and said, "You shouldn't be here doing what you're doing." Um, I, I was thinking of um, all the encounters Jesus has with broken people as he, you know, travels around and he always approaches them with such gentleness and compassion, um, which is the way, like, he's convicting their sin but in a really gentle way that 
and, and he always asks questions rather than sort of say, points the finger. Um, and, and when you come across an example of where Jesus um, is more forceful in that judgment, it's always to what he would say, the hypocrites, you know, it's all the religious people that, um, yeah, he's calling them out on, like you said before, what their heart, he knows what their heart is, but they're all about the show. So that's when he tends to be more harsh in his judgment. Perfect. If I could bounce off that, just half repeating what you just said, which is it's true, just reinforcing what you said, it's true. Um, you cannot find a word of judgment or a word of, of critical critique, of harsh critique, I should, I should say, um, by Jesus to anyone who was not a religious leader or religious person. His harshest critique was always to the religious because he saw them falling short of God's righteousness. And one of the things that I began reflecting on, was on you know, convicting the world of sin, we think that's standing up going, you've sinned. That's what we think it is. Do you know that when Jesus went into the house of the tax collector, sat down with them and ate with them, he was convicting the religious leaders of their sin, even though they didn't necessarily receive it as that. Because they stood up and said, look at him, he eats with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. Right? As if they're judging him, but actually through his very action of entering that house and sitting down with his people, he is convicting, he's showing the unrighteousness of the very religious leaders who should know better. So convicting the world of sin, it's, I think it's actually different to what we might initially imagine it to be. Turns out the story that came to my mind was when Jesus sat down and ate with the tax collector. Thank you. And apologies for stealing your thunder there, but yes. So this is the work that God is doing through his spirit. He says, I'm going to send the spirit into the world, and this is the work that, that is going to begin, to begin to happen. My spirit is going to churn things up within the world. But actually, it's not a new work. The spirit is continuing the work that we've already witnessed through the life of Jesus. And so if we're looking for evidence of the spirit convicting the world of sin, revealing God's righteousness, reminding the world of the coming judgment then we can actually look at the way that Jesus brought those very realities, reveal those very truths through his ministry to understand how we can identify how the Spirit might do that. I've been listening to some podcasts and reading some other resources. I think we, this is, this is not in my notes. I'm going way off my notes here. I think as a church, not just not Canterbury Baptist specifically, but as a wider church movement, I think we are going through a season in which our sins are being exposed. And it's deeply embarrassing as headlines are in the front pages of newspapers and, you know, royal commissions are being called and, you know, there's witnesses and judges and whole legal procedures being put to deeply examine the sins of the church and these sins are being exposed and brought into the public light. And, some, and I've heard some voices calling out saying, this is persecution, this is persecution, but I profoundly disagree with that. This is what the Spirit does. If we sin like, like the religious leaders did in Jesus' day, and we call ourselves followers of Jesus or religious leaders within our society, guess who the first targets of the Holy Spirit is always going to be? Judgment starts in the house of God. If we sin and hide it, where is the light of the Spirit going to shine first? So it's important for us when we, as a church, as a church universal, find ourselves in a moment when our sin is being being exposed and we are being called convicted of the sins that we have done, when the righteousness of God is being revealed and it's been revealed to us that we have fallen short. And there is a judgment. It's really important for us to be able to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God because he will lift us up. That wasn't in my notes, that was just for free. That work continues, continues in the church, we see it happening now, it continues in the world around us. But in our life, let's get more individual Jesus says the Holy Spirit will be one, will be the one who guides us into the truth of Jesus. I love the second dot point. We don't often think about this one, but I really love it. It comes through really clear in what Jesus says. The Holy Spirit will teach us more of what Jesus wanted us to know. Jesus says, there is more that I want to tell you, but you just can't deal with it right now, right? You're just not in the space to deal with it. It's too advanced. It's too complicated. You've got to take too big a leap to get there. You know, there's more that I want to be able to teach you, but you can't deal with it. But I'm going to send the parakletos. I'm going to send this one who will walk beside you, and this one who walks beside you will reveal more of what it is that I want to teach you. And then in our life, the Holy Spirit will empower us to live the righteousness of Christ. Can I invite you just into a moment of prayer? Let's just close our eyes. We don't even have to close your eyes, but just come to a place in which you're, 
reflecting not so much on the activities that are going on around you, but just really intentionally focusing in on a sense of God with you. Do you know that Jesus has shown us through his life what it looks like to live the life of God in the world? If you want to know what it looks like to live the life of God in the world, look at Jesus. And then Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, so that we have the Spirit of God to continue that work. This Spirit, the Parakletos, the one invited beside us. I love Luke, Luke chapter 11, verse 13, where it says, How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus shows us what it means to be fully human, the most human person who ever lived. But as a human, Jesus was limited to one place at one time. Jesus leaves, he sends his Holy Spirit so the life of God can dwell with us and through us. And by his Spirit, we all can become fully human and live the full life of God in the world around us. But let me ask you this question. This is for quiet reflection. Do you want to live the life of God in this world? to gather on a Sunday morning and reflect on these things but actually when push comes to shove when you walk out that door the church door this morning do you want to live the life of God in the world take a moment in quiet personal prayer sit before God with this question the work that Jesus began do you really want to continue it outside of these walls take a moment to reflect on that have to do the work of Jesus in our own strength. Matter of fact, Jesus knows that we can't do his work in our own strength. He has sent his Holy Spirit as the one we can invite alongside us. His Spirit will teach us, his Spirit will guide us, and his Spirit will work in the world preparing the way for the righteousness and life of God to be revealed. All we need to do is walk beside the Spirit. I'm going to invite you to take a moment and pray a prayer inviting the Spirit to walk beside you each and every day. Let's just take a moment to pray that prayer now. I'm going to ask you to make it practical. I'm going to ask you in the quietness of your own heart to think of one specific situation that you are facing where you know the life of God is needed. Whatever that means in that situation, but you know the life of God is needed in that situation. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you that you ask the Spirit to teach you and guide you in that situation this week. Let's do that now. Ask the Spirit to teach you and guide you in that situation, to walk beside you in that situation this week. Thank you. 
Holy Spirit, be with us. Life of God, dwell with us. Walk with us through all that is ahead of us. Guide us. Teach us. Lead us. So we may be more of your people, bringing more of your life into the world around us. We commit all these things into your hands in Jesus' name. Thank you for sharing with us this morning and thank you pastor for uh, leading us in uh, a profound reflection about easter so let us uh, pray loving god we thank you for easter we thank you for the profound mystery that it is and yet as we focus on this week with jesus we thank you that he did leave and that he did send the paraclete for us. We thank you that whatever our situation, whatever the challenge that we might have, that you walk with us. You walk beside, guiding us. Enable us each to be that presence this week for others in their need. Enable us to bring the light of Christ of hope in the midst of dark places. Enable us to be your church, we pray, as we now go in peace. Amen.